in our room. Uh, this response is real time because the crisis around Cox, or in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh is that there were refugees fleeing into Cox's Bazaar. Some were there prior to August 2017, but from August 2017 there was a massive influx of people, somewhere between 900,000 and 1.1 million people who came into an area that before they arrived was already an area that struggled with poverty, was hard to reach, faced annual floods and cyclones, had very few health workers, poor sanitation, and issues with malnutrition. And the malnutrition was being treated with um, SAM treatment only, so for severe, severely malnourished, no preventative work or work with moderately malnourished children. So when this influx of people happened, it created an enormous strain on the health system as well as on the communities themselves. And so today we decided to bring together a panel of people who have all been on the ground um, very recently for some of them, um, arriving from Bangladesh within the last few days. Um, and some of the, and uh, for one, a few months ago, but all of them have been involved with this response for several months, um, and I'm eager to hear their stories. One of the things that is really interesting at the moment is that there is a very high GAM rate. We will hear more about that. So malnutrition has spiked with this influx of people. There's been outbreaks of diphtheria and measles and increasing cases of diarrhea in overcrowded living conditions where there are still temporary shelters made of bamboo and tarp and an upcoming flood and cyclone season. There is a need to relocate or make better shelter for people, but there's no place to go. And it's in this complex condition where we have a community that was already there before the refugees arrived with their own needs and a massive influx of new people that our case study takes us this morning. And so, we're first going to hear from Jesse Hartness, the Save the Children Director for Emergency, Senior Director for Emergency Health and Nutrition. Um, he has a bio in the program, so I won't read that through for you all, but I want you to know that when I first started working with Jesse as a co-chair of the Humanitarian Development Task Force for CORE Group, this was what I remember, is that we had barely spoken and he went off um, to Cox's Bazaar for a month, maybe? It seemed like it was a, a big, long visit. And so I knew he was coming back with very real-time information. He was looking at how was their response as Save the Children, an organization that had been in Bangladesh prior to the crisis with a very developmental approach, and then bringing in an emergency response on top of it. Um, and so he has some really interesting stories to tell us around something that's a humanitarian's most beloved and cursed um, aspect of our work, which is coordination. Um, then we will also hear from Mafusa Rahman, the program head for BRAC, who works mostly on the research side, but has been looking at the needs of the community in Cox's Bazaar, both the host community and the refugees, to understand issues around access to health and um, hygiene, sanitation, et cetera, and also what, what kind of things build resilience for this community. Um, and BRAC is a long-standing group known to many of us for their work on bringing health care to all in Bangladesh. And so we're excited to hear their very long-term perspective on work in Cox's Bazaar. And then lastly, we have my colleague, Trina Helderman, a Senior Health and Nutrition Advisor for Global Emergency Response Team in Medair. Um, Trina has been on the ground in Bangladesh now for how many months? Five months. And she just returned here, arriving yesterday. So we have her fresh from the field. And we are an organization that only enters when there is a crisis or an emergency. We don't do development work, and so she has a story to tell us about what that was like. And overall, the theme that we want to make sure that you are able to grapple with is this idea of how do we coordinate? How do we get together? What are the things that we're bringing to the table? What are the challenges we're facing? And is there maybe some ingenuity, some innovation in this room that we can use to improve this as time goes on? So with that, 
I'll turn it over to Jesse. Should I wait for the next alarm? I don't know. <laughs> I'm scared to start. Um, thank you, Emily. Um, I, I want to say that I want to say thank you to Emily for the introduction, but also for having me as co-chair with you. So patient and um, kind, um, and it's really, really a pleasure to work with you on the Humanitarian and Development Task Force. Also, thank you to CORE. Um, the conversation about having this this conference has been going for quite some time, um, and it's such a pleasure to see the fusion that's happening over these days and the start of a very important conversation. So thank you again. Um, before I start, for those of you who don't know Save the Children, um, we are a, a global uh, organization that focuses on ensuring that children survive, are educated, and protected from harm. We work in 120 countries and span the, the development, humanitarian, transition, DRR. Um, and so we have a little bit of experience of trying to merge these conversations and the work. And this is just one example of how that may or may not work very well. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, before I start uh, on to the children's response, I just wanted to give a little bit more um, background for the Rohingya response. I'm always surprised when I talk about this emergency, how few people know, how few people know the details. Um, it doesn't break through the news cycle here in the U.S. very often. Um, you might recognize some of the video footage that I'll show, um, but the details are still a little murky for a lot of people. So just to give everyone a, a sense of, of what's happening there. Uh, where's my slides? <laughs> Great, okay. So who are the Rohingya? So the Rohingya are a Muslim minority group um, that is based in Rakhine State uh, in, in Myanmar, mostly. Um, the global population is estimated between 1.5 1, 1 and 2 million, um, and the majority have historically been found in, in Rakhine, Myanmar. Um, and up until uh, the crisis that we're really talking about, there was estimated to be about a million with, with diaspora in other countries. Um, they're very, there's a history, a long history of persecution for the Rohingya. Some people call them the most persecuted people in the world. So if we look at Myanmar, there are 135 um, ethnic groups nationally. The Rohingya are not considered one of those groups. So they, um, they're not, their ethnicity is not recognized. Um, they're considered to be illegal settlers from Bangladesh. And because of that, they were not included in the national uh, citizenship law in 1992. So they are one of the stateless people that we talk about when we talk about the stateless. So I'm going to show you a few videos. That some of it has graphic content, so just a, a warning. But it gives you a sense of a little bit of the history. This is not just a recent um, crisis, but this has been spanning decades of um, refugees fleeing, being repatriated, fleeing again, um, and we'll, we'll see a little bit of the escalation through some videos. A quarter of a million Rohingya Muslims have fled their homeland to live in camps like this, which have sprung up along a narrow coastline of southern Bangladesh since the start of 1992. So this is one of the, the first major displacements that took place, and a lot of refugees stayed in Bangladesh. So you'll see the, the numbers start to grow on top of each other, but a lot were repatriated back into Myanmar. And the violence becomes cyclical. So you have attacks from the Rohingya um, separatist groups against uh, the Bangladeshi forces um, and retaliation. And the retaliation is usually very, very severe. Um, and, and what we saw was 
uh, increasing restriction to access to, to essential services in Rakhine State. So we see a population that hasn't seen um, uh, epidemic, or sorry, vaccination campaigns in, in many years, uh, a large population of under-vaccinated um, children. More than 400 migrants adrift at sea, brought ashore to safety by fishermen off the coast of Indonesia. Mostly Rohingya Muslims from Myanmar and Bangladesh, many weak from sickness and starvation. The news spread fast in the refugee camps. Nine police officers killed in Myanmar and Muslims were being blamed. Now the 500,000 Rohingya Muslim refugees in Bangladesh fear a backlash against their relatives over the border. So as services become more and more restricted, the backlash um, against uh, the Myanmar forces becomes more and more severe, and then the retaliation escalates again. A village near Mangdong town burned to the ground its Muslim Rohingya population hiding in the jungle. Myanmar's military has raided several villages since it began its operation to look for an armed Rohingya group suspected of killing police. So a thousand civilians were killed in this incident. Um, and this is really when the international community started to think, okay, um, this isn't just a, a cyclical um, you know, retaliation and, and further retaliation. This was actually going to be potentially a massive humanitarian uh, emergency. And then in, on, June, on August 25th, 2017, this is really the date that we all talk about when we talk about the current crisis. This is when uh, militants attacked uh, 30 police posts, um, and you can see the numbers that were dead. Um, and this is, was immediately um, responded with, with extreme violence against the Rohingya, which led to the, the current um, exodus. This incident was filmed by a police officer in a village in Rakhine State and somehow made its way onto Burmese social media. It shows security forces forcibly rounding up young boys. One of the policemen is seen beating a villager with a stick before another kicks him in the head and stamps on his legs. These scenes were, were common, um, and unfortunately access to Rakhine State has been very, very limited, so, um, so the actual documentation of, of what we're seeing is, is still trickling out now. But as people started to arrive in Bangladesh, um, humanitarian, workers, humanitarian workers heard um, very, very serious and troubling reports of systematic rape, infanticide, um, and, and killing uh, of uh, entire villages, burning of villages. The reports when I was, was in Bangladesh, was they showed me a spot where you could look across the river and you could just see the flames above the trees of all the villages burning. It's a chilling and detailed account of what can only be described as a premeditated massacre. The photographs provided to Reuters by a Buddhist village elder don't lie. The first, the news agency says, was taken on September 1st and shows the 10 Rohingya captives lined up in a row. The second, taken the day after, shows their slain bodies in a mass grave. So words are being used like ethnic cleansing, um, and uh, the international community is uh, finally starting to see a little bit. I think maybe some of you may have seen some of the news footage about drone footage being shown of mass graves, of, of chemical substances being used to, to dissolve uh, the bodies in mass graves, but we still don't know the toll uh, of death in, in Rakhine State, but we do know that this next thing happened. So this is the footage that a lot of you may have seen on the news. This is the, the mass exodus that, that happened after August 25th. Um, it's estimated that around 700 people, 700,000 people crossed the border within a matter of a couple of months, the fastest refugee movement since the Rwanda genocide.
So many of them had to leave without anything. Um, they had to leave just escaping the violence on their villages, just ran into the woods. If they, if they did escape, then they had to walk for days uh, across rivers. Um, I heard lots of stories of, if you saw those boats crossing the rivers, those are Bangladeshi fishermen who were crossing the river to pick up uh, refugees and bring them back across the border. So a whole fleet of, of fishing boats to do that. 10,000 people a day is, is a massive amount of people. So when you think of Bangladesh as one of the densely, most densely populated countries in the world, where do you put a million new people? Um, this footage shows what the camps look like now, but if you can imagine, this area was where nobody, no one else really had, had settled. I mean, there were some rice paddies and some farmers, but this, fit, this, this footage doesn't do it justice. This is, this is very, very hilly terrain, very steep, this was jungle before. Um, when I was visiting the camp, they, they took me to a spot where just that morning, three children had been trampled by elephants because the elephant's habitat is no longer there and they're obviously retaliating against who's taken their habitat. So the space is, is absolutely not ideal. And if you can imagine with the, the rains, I was, I was there on a, on a very beautiful season. It was sunny and 75 degrees and I, all I could think walking through this area was what's going to happen when it rains and Bangladesh is a very rainy place in the monsoon season and there's a, a fairly good likelihood that a cyclone will come through as well. Uh, it's estimated that 200,000 of these homes will be washed away in the next couple of months. So I don't know if anyone knows before Bangladesh, before the Cox's Bazaar camps, does anybody know what the, the largest refugee camp was in the world? I'm going to scream it out. Anybody? The, up until last year, the largest refugee camp in the world was called Bidi Bidi in northern Uganda for South Sudanese refugees. Um, it was estimated at um, uh, 200,000 people. Dadaab, uh, before that, was estimated at 250,000, but the population has decreased. Kak Kakuma, also in Kenya, was estimated at 185,000. Zatari, which we saw on the slides from Paul's presentation in, in northern Jordan, was estimated 80,000. Kutupalong, which is just one of the camps in Cox's Bazar, is now 600,000 people. So we drove for three hours along the camp, and it was continuous camp, if you can imagine the, the scale. So this is by far the largest refugee camp in the world now. Kedin Ara Hana had to go sooner. Had a military husband, Ayora, our Sudu Jadar Bodu, our Kutar Bodwara, Zulungaji. Tara Zulungara had a Gulibura. What we so this is from a report that Save the Children did late last year um, called Horrors I Will Never Forget. And it was basically interviews of, of children to hear their stories and document what had happened. Um, and I read, I read the report and I had to take several breaks uh, throughout because it was so, so traumatic. Um, and when I was in the camps and talking to children, talking to volunteers and their families, um, these stories are, are just commonplace throughout the conversations and the daily interactions that people have. Um, the violence was so right, widespread that the impact will be uh, very far reaching. So taking from Paul's presentation yesterday, where he asked you humanitarian or development, what do you vote for? Obviously, this is a humanitarian situation, right? This is a, a, one of the largest humanitarian emergencies in the world right now. 
um, Save the Children it has uh, ranked it as our highest priority uh, response. But the reason why it's relevant for this session is because of this. So Bangladesh is an MDG success story. I read lots of articles before talking to you about this um, and, and looked at the statistics. I think we're all familiar with, with the, the outlier that Bangladesh has become with, with the success in the MDG area and moving into SDG era uh, with the reductions in under five mortality, morbidity, uh, remarkable progress in, in malnutrition and reductions in maternal mortality rate. They didn't re reach all the MDGs um, and there's still a lot of work to come. Uh, there's huge barriers to quality of, of care, um, huge inequities, both uh, in terms of access to, to populations and geographical access. Um, there are still huge development needs. And if we look at the area where Cox's Bazaar is in the far southeast corner, this, uh, this map shows the level of deprivation by uh, Upazila in in Bangladesh, and this is one of the worst, one of the absolute worst. So if you can imagine, there are huge development needs in this area for the host population, and now there's a million people that need assistant, humanitarian assistance. So how do we combine those two? How do we work towards the goals of longer-term sustainable development? How do we translate the progress that Bangladesh has made in the rest of the country to this area while also resourcing the need uh, for uh, helping a, a million new refugees. So a little bit about Bangladesh, or Save the Children in Bangladesh. We've, we've been working there for 50 years, if you can imagine. So um, 50 years of, of history in Bangladesh, 50 years of, of networks and, and relationships with the government um, across a, a, an entire span of, of sectors. So child rights governance, protection, health, nutrition, HIV, WASH, poverty, education, um, and we have programs in all 64 districts. The health program is particularly strong um, with uh, health and nutrition program in 18 districts and uh, additional support across all 64 districts. And a staff of 800 people, um, 65 partner organizations that we work with, and if you look at the new humanitarian staff, that increases that number by 400. The development approach, when I was reading through the development uh, strategies for a lot of the, those 90 programs that we have running, um, it's all about changing policy, um, innovating new solutions for health system improvements, advocating for those to be taken up nationally or, or district-wide at scale, um, shaping national strategies and policies, and then looking at sustainable change. The, a lot of success with the programs in Bangladesh. So I'm not here to brag about Save the Children's response or capacity in Bangladesh, but it is one of our largest and strongest country offices. So does that mean that we can do an effective humanitarian response or a timely humanitarian response? That was part of the job that I had when I went and, did, when I went and reviewed our, our response. And this is one of the quotes that stood out to me when, from a senior health leader within the organization. The assumption that a strong development health portfolio will automatically lead to a strong emergency health response was clearly proven wrong in this case. So donors, please don't repeat that. <laughs> Save the children. My boss is sitting here. Sorry. <laughs> um, but this is, this is not uncommon, I think. And, and I think it's important for us to talk about this. I know Save the Children is not the only organization that's challenged with this. But when you look at what it takes to do an effective emergency health program, this is one of our nine clinics that we did eventually build um, that is running at very high quality with very, very good staff, seeing thousands of patients per week. But as I mentioned, it's very hilly terrain. Imagine the construction expertise that's needed to do this, the logistics that are needed, the pharmaceutical supply chain, the humanitarian coordination mechanisms, all different partners, all different donors, the staffing. We had to hire directly nurses, doctors, cleaners, um, community mobilizers, etc. The supervision, the quality oversight of those services when you're managing and directly providing services. WASH infrastructure, 
referral networks throughout all of the 160 or something like that health organizations that are responding in the camps. Outbreak response. We t I talked a little bit about the low levels of vaccination coverage from a very rural population in Bangladesh. When you have a million of them all of a sudden crowded together, we see things like diphtheria, which you don't see in, in most of the world. So when you look at the, de the development approach versus the humanitarian approach, it's very, very different. We're directly managing nine clinics, one inpatient facility, a whole cadre of volunteers. We have to have an integrated approach when you have people living so closely together and all of your programs working together. So all of our facilities have co-located health, nutrition, WASH, and mental health and psychosocial support services. Very, very different from the, the programs that we have on the development side. Support to disease outbreak response, sector coordination, and then the advocacy that's needed to increase humanitarian space is very different than the advocacy that's needed um, on development programs. We're talking about very polarized political issues when you're working with a country that doesn't actually recognize the refugees as refugees. Um, so having to balance that very strong advocacy, I saw somebody wrote bear witness on one of the, the, the flip charts back there. How do you bear witness in a country and hold that country accountable to a population you're trying to serve when you're also trying to maintain those very strong uh, relationships politically? It's not to say that we didn't actually succeed. Um, this, is, this is one of the, the health clinics that we did start. Very large and successful program, very high quality of services, still a strong standing with the government, um, and we're leading coordination mechanisms in several key areas, for example, IYCFE, mental health and social, uh, psychosocial services. Um, but there were severe breakdowns in our development and humanitarian colleagues at first. They're very different styles, very different cultures, um, and there are different perceptions in quality and timeliness when you're talking about these uh, types of contexts. And then the national capacity versus our global capacity and ambition as Save the Children International. Um, one country, one development country is not going to ever be able to respond on its own to a million new refugees uh, that happen so quickly. There's always going to be a reliance on, on international assistance, especially within an organization like Save the Children. So my last slide, sorry, I don't know if I'm over time, um, is, is just a few of the observations and recommendations that we had, which I think are really relevant for this group and this topic. One is the, that institutional mandate that I talked about. So having a, an organization that is committed to humanitarian development, transition, disaster risk reduction, all of the above, you have to have that commitment from the top and it has to translate all the way down to country offices and the staff that work in the field. You can imagine that people have lives. They don't want to, they have social lives. They don't want to have to respond to things outside of their work hours necessarily unless they've committed to it in advance. And it takes a, a lot of time to transition the culture of an office to do that. Preparedness plays a huge role in that. So making sure that each country has uh, a very strong preparedness plan, keeping them updated and using them. The keeping them updated and using them part, <laughs> a lot of countries have the preparedness plan, but the keeping them updated and using them part often, often fails. And then the capacity building, those specific skills that are needed for humanitarian response. We, we, did, we do have very, very strong and qualified health and nutrition staff in, in the Bangladesh office. They're, they're amazing, actually, and they've, they've been there for a very long time. Um, but those specific skills that are needed for humanitarian response, if they don't feel confident in those, then they're going to be far less likely to be willing to take that step. And then respect for the differences in approaches. So there's a lot of <laughs> conversations of humanitarian versus development. And I think this conference is really trying to break down that versus part and really think about the hybrid of what we need to do, what we all need to do together. And, that, and the first thing to do is to really respect what, he, what all of us do. But there is, it's not, not a zero-sum game. We, there, is, there is space for all of us to work and there's a need for all of us to work. And then also better understanding the population needs. When you're talking about a refugee population like the Rohingya, GBV is one of the, the biggest issues. Um, mental health is one of the biggest issues. Outbreaks, these are not all 
um, as severe in the development populations that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis in Bangladesh. But then also, the humanitarians need to understand that they're not going to be successful if they just come in as cowboys and do it as a very vertical response. You have to actually respect those long-standing networks. You have to, it takes a little bit longer, uh, but the long-term payoff is worth it. But you also have to understand that using those networks and having those long-standing relationships actually comes with a price tag. There's going to be an expectation. If you are the global leader in IYCFE, you're going to be expected to respond with a strong IYCFE program. If you have a strong relationship with the Ministry of Health in Bangladesh, they're going to expect you to have a large-scale response, and you have to be ready to, to do that. But also the country office needs to understand, I mentioned this before, but tapping into those global capabilities. It's not all about relying on what you have in the country office and actually understanding what you know and what you don't know is really important and then being able to adhere to the global standards um, and understanding the coordination mechanisms and all of the humanitarian partners and actors that, that are involved. And the last thing is humanitarians are notorious for recreating the wheel. You don't have time always to search for that tool that you think might be out there or learn how to use it. Um, and sometimes it's easier just to do a scratch budget from Excel because you can't find the master budget and you just create it on your own. But that creates a lot of duplication and a lot of issues with coordination. And that's one of the values of, of having that strong history of, of programming in a country office that you can build on in terms of the development, bringing in those tools and those lessons. Um, so. That's where we are. Um, the, these recommendations were not only given to the country office, to the response team, but we had a, a joint workshop at the end that brought together the response team leader, the country director, and all of the SMT, the senior management team, to actually talk through some of these lessons and bring the, 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 the teams together um, because we're not going to be able to have a standalone emergency response forever. It has to be managed by the country office. We have to be leveraging those relationships. Um, and then we also fed all of these recommendations into the broader systems of Save the Children because, as I said, this isn't just a one-off response. This isn't just an issue with, with this response. It's, it's pretty systematic, and I think a lot of you can probably relate to that. So, thank you. Thank you, and I especially like to thank <coughs> core group to invite a Bangladeshi national to talk about by a Bangladeshi problem. So, uh, as Jesse mentioned, that the, the, the humanitarian crisis that is settled in Bangladesh is the largest in, in the globe. And BRAC, you know, BRAC is the largest NGO in the globe, and BRAC has responded with the, with the humanitarian crisis, so I will outline how BRAC has outlined and responded with the crisis and how the BRAC has planned to do in the near future. So this is a, um, as we, uh, Jesse mentioned that the, the major influx was occurred between October, August 2017 to uh, March 2018. So this is the fastest growing influx and every day we, we receive 30,000 individuals from Rohingya or Arkan from, Bangla, from Burma to Bangladesh. And when there is no planning period. And the, the interesting thing is the, usually we see the, the, Rohingya, uh, the refugees, they are settled in a, we used to quarantine. I mean, you cornered in, the, in the, one of the country. But in, in Bangladesh, what happens that the host and refugee, they share the same environment. They share the same uh, place as common place. And the ratio was one is to four. I mean, if you, if you see one Rohingya, 
one host community you can see four rohingya so every five people one host community and four rohingya people that's why it has been mentioned that this is the largest humanitarian crisis after the genocide of rwanda and this is a the, uh, theoretical knowledge i mean if there is a humanitarian crisis what people need i mean in first we need the food and shelter second we need water and sanitation third we need the health and nutrition fourth we need a child protection and education and then the psychosocial and legal service and the fourth one is the everybody is now working at their livelihood security so brac has responded in three phase phase one is three months for initial three months that has been uh, august to october so initially they have quickly responded with their primary health care and secondly they have installed many latrines i mean you know usually the latrine consists of six slabs so but brac has invented a frugal latrine there is a two slabs and six two slabs and four slabs is made by bamboo so because we need a lot of uh, slabs management and latrine so that's why there is a new intervention new invention is needed so brac has done that so the brac has done to cover the safe water and sanitation the third one is this safe space for children as just you mentioned that the very crowded bangladesh is already mentioned as the highly densely populated in the country in, in the world and in in the host community they have 300000 population now we have extra 1.1 million population so there there is a small area but the population is 1.4 million so shelter is is considered as an important part of the of the response and the the second phase that consisted 6 to 9 month that has been started in october and that has been ended in may so this phase 2 we have work with the behavioral messaging because the rohingyas they are they're coming from the other state i mean they don't have in the bengali knowledge the the language is the other than the bengali so there is a misunderstanding with the rohingya community and also the misunderstanding with the local community so brac has been working with, on the phase 2 and the second one that the brac has worked with the protection committee mobilization because there there is a shelter there is a security concern so brac has worked with the local and the host community and also the rohingya communities to constitute some of the protection committee that can enhance them to raise their dignity raise their voice expanding psychosocial and trauma counseling support and also brac has extensively working with basic learning provision because they are coming from the another state so they have to learn bengali or their linguistic so brac has constituted many schools and to bring all the rohingya children in the school and also the as uh, jesse mentioned that we have a two one outbreak that is alarming there was a diphtheria outbreak so brac has responded with the diphtheria outbreak and brac has also worked with the cholera and the diarrheal disease outbreak and and at the same time so as uh, jesse mentioned the, the host community is also the poor poverty is very high so they have also worked with the expanded service to the host community because there is a host community they are poorly distributed and also there is a, the humanitarian people they are coming from the rohingya they are also the poor so brac has worked with the host community to expand the service to the host and also the refugees so this is the pink color so uh, brac has the largest humanitarian response any civil society organization in in cox budget we have grounded 3200 brac staff in 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 the cox bazar that is four times higher than the whole whole sub the chilen staff are working i mean jesse has mentioned they have 800 workers in throughout the bangladesh and brac we have deployed 3200 staff in cox bazar and also we have a 6000 people with the key types of support that has been employed or extended in the rohingya communities the brac is also working with the shifting gears emergency to humanitarian response so from blanket to targeted so there was a huge population so the brac has worked with the community and then 
think they have make a targeted people with the children, with the pregnant women, with the women, even the older people. And BRAC has also the immediate need to resilience, relief to self reliance, temporary to long lasting services, shelter to communities. So the all the aspect BRAC has extended in the initial phase and the, the second phase they have also completed with expanding the service. Now we are working with how to sustain the services that has been provided in the Rohingya communities. We contributed to the joint response plan that is with along aligned with UN and other the others for the March to December 2018. The total budget is planned for 56,000 million. And the area will be covered the wash, health and nutrition, protection, education, self-reliance, livelihood, shelter and site management. The, the phase three that has been started, that will be started, or that has been started in June 2018. So we have targeted 500,000 Rohingyas and 335,000 members of the host community to live with the dignity, security, and opportunity in social and economic harmony until the acceptance repetition opportunities becomes possible. The area of focus currently were considered because you know the monsoon will start at 15th of June that and that monsoon will will long lasting for three months so we need to work on not only brag brag or save the children to work preparedness of coming monsoon how to face how to save the population from Rohingya communities from the monsoon so mapping vulnerable tents and structures and take the precautions measure, measures Comprehensive provision of life-saving water because in, in, in the monsoon period the diarrhea outbreaks occurred so we have to work to minimize the diarrhea outbreak and also we have to work to provide the safe water to the communities of the Rohingya and also the host. So the developing human capital through self-reliance and economic opportunities with the stronger community-based infrastructure such as the markets and natural resource management. And you also work with the community-based protection management that can promote the rights and empowerment. Because if you don't work with the empowerment, then there, there will be no dignity. So we want to invite them to raise their voice, to, to increase their dignity, so the Rohingya people can, can own the country. So the we host community and the Rohingya community can work together, so we can work together the SDG goals then. Also, the strengthening and improved local coordination and leadership with government and other partners. And expand the internal strategy to include the host community vulnerabilities. Because at the same time, since there is a densely populated area, we have a one-fourth one population is a host. They are also poor and the Rohingya community. So the equity and the empowerment should be worked towards the host community and also the Rohingya communities. Since I'm uh, coming from research, because the uh, moderator has mentioned, so we are also focused on research because we think that the evidence can be generated and then the evidence can be uptake by the policymakers to make a appropriate program to combat any situation. So currently, we are working uh, with the Harvard School of Public Health, also London School of Economics, because the, we need to work with the poverty, to elevate poverty, to minimize the hunger, and also the University of Toronto, especially we, we, University of Toronto, we are considering with the psychosocial trauma, with the pregnant women, the women and the, and the children. And also we advocacy part, we also work with the research part, the bringing out the unheard voice to and, and have the communities on issues which are otherwise lost in the transition. Because the voice they have raised we need to translate, triangulate them, and then make them happen. Because the host community, they, they, they are very shy. They don't raise their voice. So we need to empower them since they can raise their voice, and then that can be uh, addressed. So back, breathing, development and humanitarian needs, 
So we work with three aspects, the search, speed and flexibility, context, specific innovations, and learning and adjusting, and effective coordination. And we have a strategic priorities, the strengthening internal capacity, as Jesse mentioned, that internal capacity should be developed, and then if the internal capacity is developed, then comprehensive approach could be applied to combat any situation or the humanitarian, and also we need to develop the leadership in the humanitarian uh, crisis group and also the host group, so the leadership can raise their voice and then the, the comprehensive action can be taken. Actively participate in the humanitarian community and engage in advocacy, diplomacy and conflict resolution because there would be always a conflict between the host community and the Rohingyas. So the conflict should be minimized, otherwise there will be a tension with the host community and also the Rohingyas or refugees. And part of BRAC's mandate is to stand with marginalized and vulnerable people whenever they need it. And you know the BRAC's vision is a world free from all forms of exploitation and discrimination where everyone has the opportunity to realize their potentials. Before I go to the, my last slide, I just refer to Jesse's presentation. All we know that the Bangladesh is one of the successful countries to achieve the MDZ. And we have SDZ goals in, in near future. So Bangla and, and we hope that the Bangladesh will achieve because our Prime Minister said the, we will share food with the Rohingya people. We will share uh, the shelter with the Rohingya people. And Bangladesh is always in, is in winning situation in 71, in 74, in 88 flood. But always we win, including the cricket. So the main part of this, because the Bangladeshis have this strong will, and we, we all know that if you have a will, there is a win. Thank you. I'm much shorter than these guys are. Good morning. I will uh, try to stay on time so that we make sure that we have enough opportunity for some discussion and questions. Um, I, as Emily said, just got back from five months in being in Cox's Bazaar with Medair. For those of you who don't know, Medair is a humanitarian organization, so our mission statement is to be impartial, independent, and a neutral humanitarian organization inspired by our Christian faith to relieve human suffering in the world's most difficult to reach and devastated places. So unlike um, our colleagues who are here from Save the Children and BRAC and possibly many of you, Medair only works within the humanitarian context, so we focus on basic life-saving, public health emergencies um, at the initial stage, so in the emergency response and then that recovery, rehabilitation, that, that short transition period before it goes into the longer term development work. We do look at resilience building, we do look at capacity building, disaster risk management, but our focus is more in that initial stage of an acute emergency. And we work within three sectors, or four sectors if you split health and nutrition, uh, water sanitation, and then shelter. We are working currently in only 12 countries, so Medair is much smaller um, than these other organizations. We definitely don't have 3,000 staff in Cox's Bazaar. Um, so 12 countries, a lot of these are um, protracted crises, so within the Syria conflict, the South Sudan, DRC, um, and more recently starting in Bangladesh, but we've also worked in natural disasters. So I'm on the global emergency response team and we responded to Hurricane Matthew in Haiti, we responded to the earthquake in Nepal, um, and so we have this flexibility of responding to different types of acute emergencies, um, displacement of populations being one of those. Medair deployed our global emergency response team at the beginning of September. That team, I think, started as just a few people and grew quite quickly to about six or seven people, um, international staff on the ground. Medair was new to Bangladesh, so we had not worked in Bangladesh before. 
So we were completely new to the country, new to the context, new to the culture. Um, just finding, how do you find a car when you arrive in country? How do you find somebody who speaks English and uh, Bangla sufficiently to help you get around? Who do you buy supplies from? Where do you live? So a lot of those things we had to set up in those initial days on top of thinking about this now, you know, over 800,000 people who are in a camp that, that we need to go and respond to. This, uh, this skill set and, and these ideas um, are, are something that I think makes us a little bit unique in that we only do humanitarian. And so as Jesse talked about, and I'll mention a bit more, we have systems and procedures in place as an organization to hire staff quickly, to procure things quickly, to do that rapid scale up. On the other side, we're actually really bad at doing long-term development. So if you see us in a country too long, there might be a problem because we, we don't have the skills to do that well, and so we probably shouldn't be there. So that's one thing to, to think about with us. Um, I'm just going to show you this picture. And, and they mentioned the monsoon season that is coming. So it has started to rain. Uh, I just left on Friday. And we've had different days of really heavy rains where you're kind of holding your breath to see how bad is this going to get. And this map was shared, uh, I believe, probably mid-February. And if you look at this map, this is Kutuplong, where there's about 600,000 people. The areas that you see in blue are areas that will flood, and the areas in pink are areas that they expect to have landslides. So the thing that's quite unfortunate when you look at this is there's very little white on that map. So there's very little space. It's already densely packed with people, but there's, there's really not enough land for everyone to have a safe, safe place. And so this is a, a huge concern as we're moving into the, the monsoon and, and cyclone season. METER's response in Bangladesh initially was uh, the, a rapid response. So we, as I noted, we were new to Bangladesh, and so we weren't able to just start working. We had to work with a local partner. So we are a part of a, a global alliance called the Integral Alliance with maybe some other partners who are actually here in this room. And uh, so we were able to work within the, the Integral Alliance to do an initial distribution. So this was for emergency shelter kits and female hygiene kits. And that was done in October, November. And then we started, continued to do some assessments, did coordination, and tried to look and see what other opportunities there might be. Following that, we were able to, to continue within the shelter sector and do shelter upgrades. So we distributed shelter upgrade kits and tie-down kits for the monsoon season for just over 5,000 households that were in Kutupalong camp. This included bamboo and tarps and rope um, and uh, lots of sandbags, as you've seen the pictures, to, to just help with some of the site improvement. In doing the preparedness for the emergency response, I, I came in in January and uh, I was kind of sent in a bit as a last-ditch effort for health and nutrition. So we like to pride on ourselves on doing really good health and nutrition, and, and we hadn't been able to get that started. And there's a variety of reasons around that. Coordination was very complicated. Um, there were over 150 health partners, lots of health clinics, but maybe not quite providing the full quality, the full access to health care that everyone needed, but yet there was no space for a new partner to come in because you've seen the land issues. Um, and so it was, it was quite difficult to really find a place to work, if you will. And so I did a lot of coordination. So I, I helped to support the CMAM Technical Working Group in nutrition. Um, I helped to support the operational planning for emergency response and health, which focused mostly on mobile teams and trauma. And through that, Medair was able to set up a project with mobile medical teams. We have three core teams that are readily available and can respond should there be a landslide, massive flooding, relocation of populations. They were trained on things like mass casualty incident management, um, but they were also trained on IMCI. They were also trained on helping babies breathe. So some of the initiatives that came from you know, conferences like this that are development type programs that will help us to be able to build on and to leave something behind. It's not just an emergency response. And then, whoops, went the wrong way. And we also um, have just uh, set up three new nutrition centers as well. So when I came in in January, they were still working on mapping. We still didn't know within nutrition 
Where were the nutrition sites? Do we have good coverage? You know, there's, you, you weren't even thinking about things like sleek and squeak because there, you didn't even know where there were nutrition centers geographically, where are they even located. Even now, I don't think they still have a good understanding of coverage. Are we covering all of the areas? And so there was a lot of advocacy done to try to help push uh, organizations like WFP to add additional services so that we could make sure in a place where the GAM rate was 24.3% in the last SMART survey, can we make sure that we can have comprehensive CMAM services for the entire population, that everyone will have access not just to SAM treatment, which was kind of foundational within Bangladesh, but also treatment for MAM, treatment for pregnant and lactating women. And I know that Save the Children has also been very involved, and Medair is also planning to do CMAMI. So making sure that these infants who the, the mothers are stressed, right? So we know with, within breastfeeding, mothers are stressed. They produce less milk. They don't have enough food. There's all kinds of issues around that. But we do see, we just finished registration. There's a lot of infants less than six months who are very malnourished already. So looking at that comprehensive approach. So it is an emergency, but we need to cover all of these different areas. So we did a, I'm part of the global health cluster and uh, I'm on their strategic advisory group and we decided actually in our last meeting a, a couple of months ago we also wanted to have a session just like this. So how do we look at this humanitarian development nexus, this partnership, how do we um, put this together and we, we came up with some of these conclusions that actually it's not very natural. It's not super easy for us to just kind of link up together because we have somewhat different mandates. Um, I remember when I was doing my public health degree, one of my professors said, you're a doctor, you're going to have a lot of trouble with public health. Because as a doctor, and I'm an ER doctor, you look at that person right in front of you that's maybe going to die right now, and you give them everything you've got just to help the right now. But in public health, we want to change the systems, change the policies. We want to save as many as we can with the resources that we have. And that's kind of a similar dichotomy, I think, sometimes with the humanitarian and development side that uh, Jesse pointed out. Different philosophies, you know, that old adage, give someone a fish, they'll eat today. Teach them to fish, they'll eat for the rest of their life. But what if they're starving today? If they're starving today, you actually need to give them a fish. You don't have time to teach them. You do want to teach them, but sometimes you actually do need to just provide services so that people don't die today or, or tomorrow. We have different strengths and skill sets. It's an uphill sprint versus a marathon. We are much better sprinters. Please do not ask me to run a marathon because I will not survive. Um, standards, so we talk about quality. Within the humanitarian side, we have the, the sphere standards. We have the core humanitarian standards, things that we want to try to achieve, and we, we strive to achieve those quickly, um, as quickly as possible, and wanting comprehensive services as much as possible. You know, reproductive health was really neglected at the beginning of this emergency, but we need to also push for those services. There's a lot of women who were raped. GBV was huge. Right now is when these women are, are going to be delivering, and how are we supporting them? How are we ensuring that they have access to services? So it's this a very quick scale up of high quality services for access, knowing that you might be doing things for people that they also need to learn. But you need to have that available for people now so that we don't have what we sometimes call excess morbidity and mortality um, because of the emergency. We have different risk appetites, you know, financial risks, how much are we willing to, to spend or not. I know working with our local partner, um, Medair, our, one of our logistics uh, systems that we have in place for an emergency is if there is a big emergency within a small time period, we're able to go and procure items. And if it's less than $1,000, then we only need one quote. So this is within our system. It's for a very small period. Our local partner, their system was you can't procure anything over $100 without multiple quotes and the signature of the country director. So that's a very different um, ability to go speed and scale when you're de dealing with different systems that are in place. It's not saying that that system is bad. It's just not appropriate. It's not fit for purpose within an emergency context. You mentioned the different coordination systems. So we have the humanitarian cluster system in some countries. Bangladesh is a sector system. So it's a bit, um, 
it's a bit vague and different, and all of us had to learn how to work within that context because it was not standard for any of us. And, and I think that was difficult. But learning how to speak each other's language, you know, the acronyms are different, the words we use, the, the documents we're producing, all of this is, is different between the two sides. And so trying to figure out how do we, do we speak to each other. And in, in Bangladesh, this was definitely one of the, the issues. I know working with the the nutrition sector and the nutrition cluster, one of the things that we started doing was slowing down our speaking. So I talk very fast <laughs> as an American. Um, and slowing down and articulating our words very clearly and actually asking some of our national colleagues very specifically, tell me from SHED or SARPV, what did you do last year when there was a cyclone? What was your response? And trying to pull that information out of them because it wasn't so uh, easily, or it wasn't so forthcoming. It, it wasn't so easy to get that, that information. <clears throat> Just some of the challenges we faced as a humanitarian organization. I think we've mentioned access, registration. You know, the government of Bangladesh has policies in place to protect their population, to protect their communities, to make sure you don't have random organizations coming in and doing whatever they want, but also sometimes those policies can slow things down. And so I think that for the humanitarian actors new to the country, this really delayed our ability to rapidly scale up. And even for partners who had been there a long time, the permissions required to be able to start your programming really took quite a long time. And so that was one of the big challenges for this response. One of the things I mentioned with Medair, so we, we very much believe in building things up for the future. So we're doing emergency response, but we do use things like IMCI, Helping Babies Breathe, these, these packages that have been proven to save lives, and so we train our staff in that. The essential package of health services was defined for the refugee population when I came in in January. And so we had this integrated approach with all of the, the services, a comprehensive package. It wasn't vertical, but a lot of the, uh, the clinics that you would see around were vertical programming. So maybe over here you had just more like a dispensary. Over there they were only providing antenatal care. Over there you could go get your family planning. Over here you could go get vaccinations. It wasn't integrated. Things weren't in the same place. And when you consider the land issues, having an integrated approach was really important because we, every time we opened a new clinic, we took away space for someone's house. And so you needed to think about that on terms. You're, you're take, making someone having to go into a floodplain, possibly, or into a landslide area because you wanted to open up another health facility. And that, that was just very difficult. Um, I think one of the other things that, that I found a bit frustrating is that um, a lot of these packages, I know that they have a adapted version of them in Bangladesh. So I'm, there's an IMCI flowchart, there's CMAM guidelines, but a lot of these were not very easily found. It took us about seven or eight emails to get a copy of the IMCI flowchart in English or Bangla. Um, that, that's a lot of effort. So if you're a humanitarian agency wanting to utilize the, the foundational standards and guidelines within the country, you don't have a lot of time to be chasing it forever. And so having that stuff more readily available would have been very helpful. Um, and also like with the CMAM, there was an adaptation for, they had changed some of the guidelines for the refugees, but some of these technical guidance weren't finalized even four or five months after the emergency started. So I came in January, there were no admission discharge criteria for SAM or MAM. Everybody used their own standard. There, there was not a, a, none of the job aids or those standard templates were available for organizations new to doing nutrition for them to be able to utilize. And so the quality was quite poor. And I think that that was, that was something that um, I, I found a struggle. And then the other thing is just st uh, salary standards. You know, the government, I'm sure, has standard guidelines for what a doctor gets paid, a nurse gets paid. We asked for that many times. I still have not seen it, and I was there for five months. So having some of these things available helps the humanitarian organizations coming in who are new to be able to not mess things up. You know, we don't want to come in and mess things up for, you know, the great progress that organizations have been able to make 
in Bangladesh. But if we don't have access to that information, it's hard for us to, it's hard for us in some ways to not mess it up by paying the wrong salary or hiring the wrong cadre of staff. Okay. Huh? Okay, I'm going to go a lot faster. Um, so I'll just go for the way forward. How's that? I've got two slides. So for the humanitarians, we, we also have lessons to learn. How can we do things better? And we should all be promoting the local standards and guidelines. So I think sometimes I feel like MEDA is slightly unique in this, but I think the other humanitarian organizations should be promoting this. Use what's already in the country. Use the guidelines already there. Use the standards, the drug list, all of that that's already there. So the people we're training, we're training to continue within the country that they're living in. We should be adapting our language and style so that we can enable other actors who aren't used to the humanitarian system to be able to participate so that they can participate in coordination more effectively and feel more confident to share their experiences and their ideas. And then also just recognizing our strengths. You know, like I said, MEDAR shouldn't stick around for a long time. We're, very, we're not very good at doing policy development. We're not very good even in some of the advocacy lines. That's, those aren't our strengths. But we can do direct implementation. We can train local health workers, nutrition workers to provide really good quality care based on the local standards. And that's where we should focus and, and emphasize um, our time. And then for those, those more development actors, I think uh, Jesse mentioned this, seeking to understand what strengths the humanitarian actors bring. You know, we don't want to come in and mess things up, but at the same time, we can go very fast. You know, we're agile, we're fast, we can do a big, massive scale up in a short period of time. We hired 50 staff in two weeks to do health and nutrition, trained them up, and they're now out implementing within about a three and a half week time period. That's very fast. Um, but it's because we have systems and things in place to enable us to do that. Communication is also really important. You know, trying to um, communication in terms of coordination, but then also advocacy was mentioned. We really do need the development actors to advocate for humanitarian agencies to be able to come in. We know that there is a need for our skill sets, especially in a small period of time. But we can't always um, verbalize that or communicate that well to governments and, and systems that are in place well before we come. And so having that advocacy and that communication is really important, provided those standards and those guidelines. And then lastly, prioritizing efforts. I think one of my biggest frustrations in this response is there were a ton of actors doing a ton of things, but it it wasn't quite efficient or effective because we weren't working together. We weren't recognizing our, our strengths and our weaknesses and saying, I can't do all of this. I can only do this one small thing. And so looking at your limitations, maybe consolidating and ensuring you can provide a good quality comprehensive approach versus a lot of vertical programs across the board. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. It's really hard to cut off Trina because she's from my own organization and also because all of the presentations were very interesting for me. But I want to have a little bit of time for discussion. Um, our set time to end was 10, 10.30, but we are able to stop at 10.35 to allow just a quick time for discussion. So please, um, let's hear from you. Questions, comments? <coughs> Yes, I see someone right here. I'm not sure where the microphones are, so we can get a microphone. Could, could people who want to ask questions please stand up? It's hard for people to see you from the stage. I see someone right here. And can here. the volunteers please pass the mics and be ready to hand the mics to Let's people go standing right Thank here, you. and then we can Great. come over this side. Great. Thanks. Oh, I see some people at a microphone already. Okay, did I miss that? And are you taking questions in groups of three? Yeah, I'll take I groups recommend. of three. And maybe one round. Thank yeah. you. Perfect. All right. Hi, I'm with USAID Food for Peace, helping work on the Rohingya crisis. Um, and my office actually does do both emergency and development programming, and we've put a lot of resources into Bangladesh. With the goal of this conference being the humanitarian development nexus, I actually am really intrigued by some perhaps more concrete um, approaches or deliverables that as a donor we might be able to fulfill. I obviously know we could put more development funding in, do more host, host community support, et cetera. But other than advocacy, diplomacy, and funding, 
I'd appreciate your thoughts on some more concrete um, thoughts for how donors can help. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, let's go here. Thank you very much, panel, for this uh, really wonderful and enlightening uh, presentation. My name is Michelle Farmer. I uh, am the chair of NCD Child. Um, I had a question about the workforce that is uh, being organized at the community level in these humanitarian settings, specifically because, um, in general, I imagine we're dealing with a fairly young population. And um, being a person who generally works with youth uh, leaders, I'd like to know to what extent you have mobilized a young workforce that could be there for um, many years to help um, for this crisis and could be in a uh, good position to help you with future crises. Thank you. Okay, and let's take a question from this side of the room. I saw someone at the second table here. If we can get a mic over. I know there's some people over there. We'll get back to you for the next round. Thanks. Uh, Michaela Arthur, I'm a health advisor with USAID and the Asia Bureau. And my question is based on conversations we've had recently within the agency about how we better bridge this gap that you're talking about. Um, potentially, you know, embedding a development coordinator within our DART teams or, you know, how could we create a model for the agency um, that would help to kind of do a better job of bridging? Um, so I, my question to you would be, is there a model that you've seen? Um, is there a proposed model that you haven't seen that you see could have, you know, some success um, in the field? Thanks. Great. So over to you guys. Does anyone want to take the first question about some concrete examples? Thank you. So I think my first point is we have the Humanitarian Development Task Force meeting today at 2 to 3.30, <laughs> I think. Um, and a lot of this, this stuff is, is in our TOR, our work plan. Uh, we would love to have USCID and other donors in the room. OFDA has been pretty active on that, on those calls. Um, but that's one of the biggest things that we're, we want to talk about. We want to talk about building flexibility into, um, into you know, the, the calls for proposals, um, talking about longer time frames for humanitarian um, funding, mm -hmm. um, and looking at things like cross crisis modifiers in large, um, large USAID or other donor awards that help um, reallocate some of those longer term funds to then transition the capacity in that country to be able to immediately respond to emergencies. So there's a, a few things that we're working on. OFDA has, has started looking at longer term APS style um, investments. They've also uh, expressed interest in investing in, in learning more about the humanitarian development nexus. Um, so I think there, there's a lot of room for donors to be engaged um, in that. And I would encourage a lot of you to, to join the, those conversations if you can. And then the next question was about um, looking workforce. to build up a young health workforce. Yeah. yeah. I can make a comment as well. Uh, I think the, I, I might address the, the second one, the involving the young and adolescent and BRAC is uh, working with the establishing some of the schools and the uh, BRAC is involving some of the young women who are educate, educated as a teacher and also BRAC has established some of the ADB club, adolescent club that has invited the young men and women to, to engage themselves uh, doing some of the economic growth action and also BRAC is planning to do some of the uh, programs that can engage some adolescent girls and the uh, AZ or geriatric older men or men. Excellent. And then I think the last question was a little bit similar, but does anyone have anything specific to address this question from USAID about um, kind of response to what they're doing or ideas for how they might be able to do some different things. I kind of weaved that into my first I think so, question yeah. and answer, <laughs> but was there anything else? No? I would actually say, because the time has been so short, and I'm, I'm really sorry that we didn't have more time for discussion, but um, we would invite you, if you'd like, you can come up and chat with some of the panelists um, during this break. Um, we totally welcome that. And we also invite as many of you as possible to attend the, work, the task force meeting this afternoon um, because we will be fleshing out 
kind of the practicals of this. There's a time for discussion and response on what we've been hearing built into our agenda this afternoon. And so we do welcome you to have some of that continuing discussion and in your concurrent sessions, which are also on these themes. So um, I want to thank the panelists. And uh, I hope you'll join me. And I really appreciate all that you've done. I like the different perspectives we were able to hear. And thank you.